You know, you could have mold in a home and not see it. Your home looks beautiful, which is what happened to me. My name is Michael Rubino. I'm on a personal mission to make sure you don't get sick inside your own home. I knew there was something wrong. I'm just so relieved there's something that you can do about it. Thank you for joining me here for another episode. I'm your host, Michael Rubino. And today's special guest is Dr. Ashley Beckham. Dr. Ashley, thank you for coming on. This is actually the second time that you've been on the show. And uh, thank you for, for you know, giving your time away twice here. Um, and the first time we, we brought you on as an expert, and of course, being that you are an expert in, the, in your field, I'm sure we'll cover some of that stuff too. But really, we want to talk more about your personal story, which probably helped propel you as an expert, right? So uh, tell us, you know, what run-in you had with poor air quality and how that kind of transpired into doing what you do now. So one thing that I think was always really fascinating to me is that, you know, you could have mold in a home and not see it. Your home looks beautiful, which is what happened to me. I was in this beautiful home. And even though the first weekend when I moved in there, actually the ceiling in my office kind of fell through, right? And then they patched it up normal, right? Because I didn't know too much about this at the time. And, um, and then kind of fast forward a year and a half later, I was the sickest I had been in maybe 15 years. So I was someone who had a lot of different kind of chronic things, but I had sort of figured out that maybe it was from food and gluten and things like that. But when this happened in the home, you know, I started because I was seeing this with my clients over and over and I started to run mold mycotoxin panels. And I thought, well, let's just run the whole thing. I ran Lyme, you know, very comprehensive Lyme viruses and mold panel. And they were all very, very high and very positive. So that prompted a home inspection, right? And again, I became the patient that I had been working with, but it was me now. And that was just very strange. And I had really... It ended up being a very big gift, right? Because I learned about a lot more and that's what had me seek out kind of information that you were providing about what to do when it's your home, right? I know what to do when it's your body, but the home is a whole nother place. All, you know, all of your things, all your belongings. And again, it first started with getting an inspector and, you know, basically also they, they told me that in their meeting, they used our home as the example of one of the cleanest on the outside that you could see with one of the highest numbers in every single thing that they kept pulling uh, wow. samples of, right? So when I got the report back, I wasn't that great at looking at home reports yet. And I, I just looked and I said, this is really bad, isn't it? We need to move. <laughs> and I was so sad because again, it was, you couldn't see anything, right? I mean, once you learn more, you could, but to the naked eye, everything looked really nice. And um, and I just assumed when they patched things up, it was fine, but it wasn't. So, all right. So I think that really helps highlight the fact that, you know, a lot of homes that I go into, they look immaculate, Yeah. right? I mean, um, going to Paltrow, yeah, so not, It's not even the little things that now we know to look for. Like it looks perfect, really. I just uh I just left LA. It was at Justin Baldoni's home. Uh he's an actor for for those that may not know him. And his home was super nice, super cool, um, great design. And um, you know, you under the underneath this, right? We found problems. Yeah. But on the surface, a lot of these homes that I walk into every single day that are not good, they're toxic, mm -hmm. are beautiful. They look Amazing. You would never tell unless you actually looked at the data. You move into this house. What are some of the symptoms you started to experience? And you already told us that you started thinking it was gluten and other things. You started, you know, checking in that direction. Um, so just let us know exactly what you were experiencing. And then, you know, when you started trying these other things and they weren't working, how long did it take you to really come to that realization that I should have my home checked? Sure. So uh, let me see. So I started feeling, uh, I had a lot of, a lot of fatigue, a lot of joint pain, 
a lot of, uh, I had migraines come back, which I hadn't had in a long time. And so where previously I was able to manage all of those symptoms, more like the migraines and joint pain by eliminating gluten and dairy and sugar. So I had been doing that for 10 years. So I can always tell if, if something maybe was hidden somewhere and I would get some pain, but this was in, you know, this was every day now. So something was different because my diet was the same, right? I, I was perfect with all of that. So I realized there must be something that I'd been exposed to that was creating probably my weak areas. You know, a lot of people, they have a weak area or system. So like that's where sometimes kids get more asthmatic and respiratory things and anxiety. And then someone else in the family gets headaches and joint pain, right? So for me, that's where it goes. But it was a lot more than just normal. So I had also transitioned to an online business and I thought, well, this should be much easier than seeing patients because I was seeing 25 patients a day, driving an hour and a half each way for a commute in LA. So I thought this should be very easy. I should have so much more energy, right? Than, than what I was previously doing. So it was just significant and I hadn't felt this way. This was, so maybe 15 years ago, I my joint pain when I was younger was so much where it hurt to walk or hold the cell phone. Um, and it was in various joints that jumped around. So those are also classic Lyme symptoms, but, um, you know, I didn't recall having a tick bite or anything like that. So I never checked it. And, but then once I started again, realizing that these are common symptoms that I see with my clients, I thought, well, we need to do a full panel. Right. And, but again, nothing seemed out of the ordinary at my home and, I, you know, again, I didn't look in any of the places that are the typical places because they were, you know, an attic or laundry room or things like that. So I wasn't out and about looking, but everything had been painted over since we had moved in. So everything looked pretty good. And the same, once someone that knows better, you know, can point out, oh, there's been a lot of previous water damage here. You just can't tell. And, uh, oh, actually, sorry, what happened was, too, is the water company called us and said, you must have a leak somewhere in your property because, you know, you're, you're um, churning through too much water. And so it happened to be in our foundation, which is mm -hmm. a whole nother big problem, right? Yeah. So we couldn't see any of it. Never. The only uh, indicator was basically a giant water bill. Interesting. Yeah. So. <laughs> So you all, you already were lucky enough to kind of be around it and see some of the stuff presenting in your clients. So when yes. everything else didn't work, you know, you did a mold panel on yourself. And yeah, once you did the same that, thing. I love data. <laughs> yeah. And once you did that, you're like, huh, I better check my house. Then you realize you have a high water bill. You bring some people in, you figure out that this is not a good environment. So mm -hmm. you get out of that environment. Yes. And yeah. I, and, and I, I kind of knew, but you know, our inspector was great. And he was like, can you move? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, you need to move. And I, you know, and again, I said, well, how soon? Like in, we were planning maybe six months. He said, no, like a month, like you need to get a new house, like ASAP. Because I also did labs on my uh, mom and daughter and we all lived together and everybody had mold. Right. Mm. And then my mom, I also do genetics. So neither of us have the genetic predisposition, but my mom does. And, um, and again, we had high levels in our kitchen and she happened to be in the kitchen a lot. And so I was more concerned or I was very concerned with her as well, even though I had a lot of symptoms, but they were different, right? Cause we just have different systems. Yeah. So I just, I just want you to say this louder again for the people in the back. Um, you do not have a genetic predisposition that makes you susceptible to environmentally acquired illness, but you had environmentally acquired illness. And I had the worst symptoms of everybody in the house, you know, and one of those, uh, you know, again, my mom does, is the one with the genetic predisposition. So, so I, you know, the reason I want to cover that so, so uh, boldly is because you know, a lot of people believe that there's just a few unfortunate, unlucky people out there that are susceptible to their environment. And, yeah. you know, I know that's not true. You know, that's not true, but it's really important to highlight. And I probably don't highlight it enough is the fact that 
this affects all of us, right? And of course, we all have different genetic makeups. Some of us have better immune systems than others, right? We're all uniquely different human beings. Um, but the point being is that you don't have to have specific gene mutations to be impacted by the amount of breaths that you take each day. And more importantly, what's in those breaths because you take 20,000 breaths per day. Yeah, and it's, again, I wrote my thesis on gene epigenetics and certain compounds and you know, how to help these things. So I've been fascinated with customizing protocols and nutrition and things and detox with genetics. And it drives me crazy because how that get that phrase gets reworded all the time. It's basically like, oh no, there's a small or 25% of the population who can't deal with mold, but everyone else is great with it. Right. And again, it's just not true. It just makes them more susceptible potentially, right? All of this is potential. Life comes in and changes us all. And a big mold exposure in someone's life can knock down anybody, you know, with genetic predisposition or not. So. Right. Well, you know, I'm not a doctor and, and you are, so this is great. We can have this organic conversation here, but genetics, obviously they, they can increase your susceptibility. Yeah. We understand that, but let's just say I have the perfect genes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I could still get sick because we're talking about genes here. Our immune system is a whole separate facet of our, our, our human health, right? Yes. And there's only so much my immune system can tolerate before right. I'm going to display an immune response. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when we're talking about creating healthy environments, yes, we have 25% roughly of the population that might have gene mutations that make them more susceptible to environmentally acquired illness. But that doesn't mean the other 75% should not worry about their environment or not be on top of their environment or make sure that their environment is safe. Because you see, the other 75% of the population still has what's called an immune system and hormones and gut right. and brain and vital organs that can be, become impacted if they're in toxic places, correct? Yes, yeah. Well, and so a couple things to say with that, right? So I talk about mold as kind of being a sledgehammer to the immune system, right? That's anybody's immune system, depending. That doesn't depend, you know, if someone has this variant or if they're more susceptible to heavy metals or whatever toxin it could be. But mold kind of supersedes all that because it's so problematic to the immune system, with, which then allows all these other things to flourish, right? And that's where a lot of these problems come, especially with Lyme and Epstein-Barr and think autoimmune issues. But the other thing I would say is again, with genetics is that, so the genes stay the same, say the same, but our reaction to them and the expression is what changes. And so 90% of genetic issue, you know, um, not genetic issues, but expression is all from environment, right? So how we live, the things we're exposed to. So mold is part of that. So mold coming in and being a part of your world and experience that can switch on the expression of an unfavorable gene expression. And that's where we get our symptoms and possibly disease down the road. Hmm. And this brings evolution and all these other topics of discussion into the foray here. But obviously the, the main problem is we live in these homes. We are, human beings are animals. We used to live outdoors, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we've evolved and now we live indoors where we spend 90% of our time. And since 1970s, when we were dealing with an energy crisis, we started pushing more into energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. And now we have these tighter homes. So we have less air exchange from outside to inside than ever before. So we can be breathing in a higher concentration of toxins than we ever have before. And things are getting worse, folks, not better. We keep building tighter and tighter and tighter. So this is where these things start to really express themselves in our global health population, right? Because, um, well, 
60% of the global population deals with at least one chronic condition, 40% multiple chronic conditions, meaning two or more. That's a lot, folks, by the way. Uh, another interesting study is that 74% of the U.S. population is on one prescription medication right now. 74%. That's a 19% increase since they last checked, I believe, 2019. Oh, well, yeah. So uh, we're heading in the wrong direction. Yeah? Yes. But what's really interesting about that is we have better access to medicine than ever before, better technology than ever before, right? So we're testing, diagnosing things. We're understanding more things. But how are we getting sicker? I'll tell you my theory. My theory is that we're not looking in the probably the number one place we should be looking, which is our the air we're breathing. I think it's really the last thing on 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 everybody's list. And I think you'll see that probably expressed in the clients that you see all the time when you're like, hey, have you thought of your home? They're like, my home. What does my home have to do with my health here? It's like, um, maybe everything. Not sure, but <laughs> But we could find out, right? We can test it and figure it out. How much correlation are you seeing in people's symptoms and their environment? I mean, yeah, it's it's the biggest it's one of the biggest things I talk about, right? Is because it's part of our foundational health, right? Besides the food we put in our body and the water that needs to be clean, the air we we breathe in every day has to be clean too. And those are just foundations of us being healthy on a, a very basic level, right? Unfortunately, a lot of us or a lot of people don't have those things. Like the, you know, they're eating all kinds of food. They definitely aren't checking the air quality. And we have a lot of these microorganisms that can be really affecting our system. So it's really, really critical and kind of what you're saying, at least my clients and the, the people that I see and talk to, everyone is very sick with multiple layers of things going on. And sadly, most of them have seen or been trying to go from doctor to doctor to ask, like, you know, they, they I talk to people all the time and they say, can I just ask my GP to run this lab? And I said, you know, they're not going to check mycotoxin test. They might send you to an allergist, but they're only going to check for mold allergy. And then they don't know how to see if there's mycotoxins in your body. And so I forget because our world's very different, right? We're used to using these alternative tests and things that really help us. But the average consumer often is still in the kind of very Western medical uh, mindset. And so they get stuck in that or they ask their doctor and they're like, oh, mold doesn't do anything for the body. You know, I mean, how many times have you heard, I'm sure a client, you come oh, into yeah. their and they said, well, my doctor said this isn't even a thing, right? And this happens all the time. And then I feel so bad because my clients are questioning their, their uh, almost their sanity because they know they're sick, all their labs are normal and they feel terrible. And then they're told their doctor, who's an authoritarian, you know, authority on health in their opinion dismisses that well i think that you know yeah that, that happens all the time right we know that um every every interview every story you know they went to a doctor doctor didn't tell them about mold right or tell them to check their environment for environmental toxins we get that that's because it's not being taught in medical school simple right. as that if it's taught in medical school and everybody knows about it everybody would be telling people to check for it, right? But it's not taught mm -hmm. in medical school. Therefore, this is where the gap is. How do we solve that gap? We, we put it in medical school. I mean, it's only really that simple, folks. But I think the, the bottom line is before we even get to that point, right? There's so many different layers of things that have to transpire, right? Well, one of the bigger issues is that because it's, it's not going to be in medical school until we understand how to treat for it right? Which is such a specialized thing right now, as I'm sure you know, that the do doctors aren't going to tell you to check for it if they don't have an answer of what happens if you find it, right? And what do we do? And especially considering the fact that a big piece of the puzzle is, okay, so you have it in your home and you have it in your body. Good. Well, as long as you have it in your home, it's going to continue to get in your body. So we can treat your body, but you still have it in your home. So as quickly as you're removing it from your body with treatments, you're also getting new particles and toxins entering your body because it's in your environment. So really now treatment becomes a two-part equation, fixing your home, fixing your body, right? Which 
is a lot to confront at once when you're already not feeling well. But that's yeah. kind of where we're at. Um, now, how do we change that systemically? There's there's many different ways. Um, I, I know I'm working on it at the foundation level. Um, there are lots of things that that need to happen. And honestly, they're not that complex. But I think one of the bigger issues is we need s- major paradigm shifts and major systems because you know, we're talking about people that rent. Well, they're at the mercy of the landlord, right? Yeah. Well, I don't want to throw shade at the landlord because ha- do you guys know that the landlord itself, they don't have mold coverage from an insurance. You cannot have mold coverage on a property that you do not live in. Mind blowing. How's that even allowed? How's that even possible? Well, because government doesn't over doesn't have any oversight here because they don't realize it's such a big problem that they need to have oversight on. Mm-hmm. So there are no regulations. Let's take it a step further. How do we have regulations if we don't have any standards? Well, the EPA has been for the past 20 years trying to develop standards, but how can they develop standards when they think the gold standard is air testing in the center of a room and comparing that with outside to inside? If that's a gold standard, we're severely sucking here because that is not going to be proper data to make proper decisions on what I'm being impacted in my own home. So as you can see, there's all these different layers. And believe me, I I think about them all the time. And I have some ideas on how we solve some of these problems, but it's going to take all of us kind of coming together and demanding this change. And governments, and I say governments, because this isn't just a problem in the US, governments are going to have to step up and start looking at how do we regulate this, all the different industries that, create this issue. Uh, how do we deal with this from a healthcare perspective and a, and a home insurance perspective, right? Cause that is definitely going to need some regulatory review to figure this out. Otherwise we're at this place. Now where we're at today. If you don't happen to find me or happen to find you and have both pieces exactly aligned, odds are you are going to get false information. And you are going to stay in this house that's making you sick and undergo treatments that will not get you better, right? And that's where so many people are. And that's why, like you said, they go from doctor to doctor. That's because they have to go through 10, 20 doctors to finally find someone that understands what they're going through and can help them get out of it. Right. I think, too, there's a couple of things with what you were saying, you know, the amount of things that I've heard either, I mean, for sure, Western doctors, but even naturopaths or chiros, you know, if you're not trained in mold, I feel like they shouldn't be speaking to its effects and its possible issues in the body, right? Because of the amount of, I just, I guess I'd say ridiculous things that I've heard from other practitioners, it's, it's really sad because then again, that person is, you know, wasting more time and wasting more years and resources by not addressing mold, which is usually at the top of a root cause of very impactful on their chronic illness. However, it's manifested, if it's autoimmune right. or, you know, Lyme or whatever it is, Epstein-Barr. And that's what happens all the time is most of my clients come to me. They're like, I have Epstein-Barr, I have Epstein-Barr. And I said, no, let's figure out why you have Epstein-Barr, right? I'm pretty sure you have mold, but let's check it out. And so again, you know, replace that with Hashimoto's or Lyme or whatever it is. And we just have to use tests, but it's great. At least we have access to these tests, right? Even five years ago, they were not as readily available, but definitely not 10, 15. So it's really good. There's been a lot of, progress in that area. But at the same time, there's also, I would say, a lot of this new subset of people that are so afraid that like they, you know, then they're constantly checking like every home and they, it's almost like they don't think that they can find a place that's clean that, you know, everyone tries to find like 100%. Not going to happen. So, right. I'm like, Okay, that's not your goal either. <laughs> because I, ha- I have a beautiful house, guys. I ripped it. I ripped it down to the studs and rebuilt the entire house. I mean, I, all new windows, all new doors, new roof. I redid the stucco. I redid every wall on the inside. All new bathrooms. I mean, 
You think you think perfection exists. It does not exist. You have to create it. Right. And this needs we need a paradigm shift as people, as families, as human beings, because at the end of the day, if we expect perfection to exist and we're just going to test every house and buy the perfect house, you're going to be testing and, and, and then in that buying phase forever. Right. What I do personally, and, and it's not for everybody because, you know, it's, it's a lot of work, but I just find the ugly house on the block that has good bones and I just redo the whole thing and I buy it as low as I can buy it for that still makes sense to put whatever money I need to put into it. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Cause as long as I have equity, when I'm done, I know I've made a good financial decision. Right. And that's what I do. And I've done it for, this is my third house. Mm -hmm. And whoever's buying that house from me has, they don't even know the deal they're getting. Right. Cause not only does it look nice, but it's healthy too. Right. And we've, I just, I don't, I just don't leave any stones unturned. Now, if you don't have the stomach for that, right. Then what you should do is find a house that you know is going to have some problems, test it, figure out what those problems are. And then it's a mathematics equation, right? Okay. This house is going to cost me, I don't know, half a million dollars. And it's got about fifty thousand dollars worth of work needed to make it healthy. I'll be all in for five fifty. Does that make sense or not? Right? Will I live in this house long enough to recoup that investment, or you know, am I okay with taking on that amount, knowing maybe if I do sell in five years, I might get six hundred instead of five fifty, and I'm I'm on the upside, right? That's how things need to be because honestly, finding this perfect house, it won't exist. And even when you make it perfect, like if you find one mold spore in there, you don't, don't lose your clothes, you know, don't lose or your mind. It just, it just takes one leak, right? That's the thing. It's like any home that has water, which is every single home, potentially something can go wrong in your lifetime of living there. Right. Yeah. And, and you have to remember like when something does go wrong, right. You're empowered with the information that you now have yeah. going through this process to act on it properly right? Exactly. Where things go wrong is when you have a house that might've existed even 20 years before you bought it. Mm -hmm. And who knows how that person dealt with those 20 years worth of issues that propped up. Right. Plus most people going into this, they learn way too late, right? So now they're sick. They've had 20 years of mysteries. They've lived in the house 10, 15 years. Now they're remembering all the leaks that happened during those 10 to 15 years that they didn't take care of properly because they didn't know. And they just expected, you know, people to come in and do the right thing when those leaks happened, which I, I don't blame you. They should, but this is where we're at folks, you know, and you know, now they have 25 years worth of issues. They have to deal with all at once. Right. And that's, that's where the overwhelm starts to set in. And I get that. Um, these are not easy financial decisions to make, but this is what we have to do to make sure that our families are safe right now. Now, when all these paradigm shifts happen, which hopefully happen in my lifetime here, uh, we're going to be in a much better spot because our homes are going to be built better. They're going to be maintained better. We're going to be more knowledgeable. This is going to be you know, a very important topic that we all know about. See, you cannot become an adverse effect of something that you have an awareness of. It's just a random law, right? Why is that? Because you know about it, you can control it, right? Barring crazy storms that are outside of our control, which unfortunately do happen more and more all the time now, um, we pretty much can be in control of our environment. And even when a storm does happen, if we know about everything that we should, we're going to tell our insurance companies, no, 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 you're not half-assing this thing. We're doing this properly and I'm going to test and evaluate before you start putting materials back. Mm. That doesn't happen very often. And all the people we talk to, you hear about these leaks. It's like my insurance company came in and I don't know, I just thought it was done right. Well, we need to empower ourselves with this knowledge so that we can make sure things are done right, right? And if we do that, we're going to be better off for it and we're going to be more in control, right? And so instead of instead of really looking at things from this despair angle, which unfortunately when you're sick and you're going through it, it's hard not to look at it. We have to start saying, how can we take control now? 
The other thing about this too is, you know, if you get a good inspector, you're probably going to have like a couple hundred page report and things are going to have all these photos and all these test results. It's going to be very overwhelming, right? We have to look at things scientifically. What's creating the most amount of impact? What can I do right now with whatever resources I have right now to make a difference? And that's possible. I mean, I've worked with people who have spent a million dollars renovating their, you know, compound, estate, whatever you want to call it. And I've worked with clients who spent five, 10 grand doing what they could afford to do to, to make an improvement. And every single one of these people and all the people in between, they find relief. Yeah. Right. And that's incredible. So I wanted to ask you, and I, I'm not, I have a, probably have a hard time phrasing this, but yeah, you see people that have multi layers of issues, right? Maybe they have Lyme disease, maybe they have Hashimoto's, maybe they have both, maybe they have Epstein Barr virus to throw another thing into the mix, and now they have mold exposure, right? And I'm not saying that you fix your environment and you start treatment prot protocols, and all of a sudden your ten symptoms are gone, right? Right. But I win. but what I notice is that some of those symptoms go away. Right. Mm -hmm. So maybe they don't solve all 10, but maybe they get rid of four or five right off the bat just by leaving, you know, yeah. to, to remediate. So what I want to, you know, I want to understand is how many, if you had to throw a percentage out there, how many of your clients that you're seeing that are dealing with symptoms, how many of them see at least one symptom improve the second they get out of mold? Get out as in just even leave for a week to go even just leave just to leave yeah. you know just to leave maybe they leave maybe they move out yeah. maybe they sell least, maybe they remediate at least 90 percent, some symptom will ameliorate or go away um uh, but i, I know huge. yeah and the other thing i would say too because this is why i shifted so much focus on this even though it happened um say for me because I did learn so much and this has been a big part of my progression into this specific area of biotoxins is that probably at least 98% of my whole practice is mold related because I see it over and over and over again that at this point it's surprising to me when I don't see it well so that's crazy to me if 90% of the people that you see find relief the second they're out of mold on at least one symptom, I'm not saying all symptoms, at least one yes, symptom. <laughs> that is huge, right? Because that tells us that 90% of the people were being impacted by the air they're breathing inside their home. No matter how great that impact may be, no matter how many other layers there are to it, that means this is worth doing that that is worth figuring yeah. out what the problems inside your home are and making sure that you are, you have as healthy of a home as possible. And a lot of people too, this is not their first mold exposure, right? Most, you know, just growing up, most people, like I remember my childhood home, we had pallets on the bottom of the basement because it flooded a lot in Texas and you just, you know, threw those down to like, let it dry out. But um, you know, obviously there was a bunch of mold in my childhood home and for most people, right, this is not usually the mold exposure that I'm working on with them is not their first time Then their body could have maybe handled so much. And then this is usually the straw that breaks the camel's back and they're very ill at this point. Yeah, no, I mean, I had asthma as a kid, so I, I grew mm -hmm. up in a New York city apartment. I mean, you know, yeah. And that's really a challenge too, because you can't control all the people around you, right? Because uh, it's not just your isolated unit, right? You're totally. you're at the mercy of all the other units, which again, apartment complexes are notorious for mold for various reasons. Especially in the 80s and 90s, you know, mold was not a thing. You threw bleach at it, you painted over it, right? So, I mean, it 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 just has compounded from there. I want to talk about, you know, uh, I use the word layers, and I want to talk about how all these other things fit into this. Um, because, you know, we, I see this all the time. I mean, all the clients that I see, and again, I'm not a doctor, right. And, but I 
always notice when I clients are coming to me, I always try to get into conversation with them, get an understanding of what they're feeling, how they're feeling. I want to make sure that the work that I'm doing is going to make a difference. Right. And what a lot of people will come to me and they'll have Lyme disease or they'll have Hashimoto's or mm -hmm. Epstein-Barr virus. Yeah. Um, and I look at them as, I look at the, I look at these names as labels, right? Um, and that's just a personal belief of mine. I think, I think we, in, in, in Western medicine, we tend to do a lot of symptoms equals label diagnoses, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so we have, they have all these different labels that they identify with that express how they're feeling. And there's always this correlation with mold. I don't know what it is, right? And maybe it's, maybe it's a fluke. Maybe it's just because mold affects everybody and this is a fluke. But for me, I, I'm a very um, observant person with patterns. It's actually mm -hmm. how I got into this. I observed patterns of people getting sick after Hurricane Sandy. I said, this doesn't make sense. I got to dive more into this. Then I started observing patterns of how people are air testing or missing beneath yes. the surface. And then I started messing around with dust testing technologies and mycotoxin te technologies and starting to see how all this played into people's profile of how they're feeling. So one thing I've observed, and I'm, I'm not looking to get into the discussion of causation and or exacerbation, but I am very interested in highlighting the fact that anybody with Lyme seems to be more susceptible to feeling sick when mold's in their environment or Hashimoto's or Epstein-Barr virus yeah. or lupus, yeah. uh, pick an autoimmune disease, put it on the screen and it, it probably is going to fit in into this bucket. And um, I'm drawn to, to, to understanding that. Yeah. I, so I would love your take on it. I know a lot of this is going to be theory because, you know, heck, we, we need just so much more clinical studies to really understand the brevity of impact here. And I'd love to hear, you know, what you're seeing, your theories on how all of this ties together. Sure. So again, what I would say is that mold for me is often the common denominator in almost all the clients I see. And I literally can think of two people in my entire practice that have not had mold come back, if that helps. But what I would say is, again, it's this, I think of it as a sledgehammer to the immune system. And so the mold can impact the immune system so much that then it allows other things that are latent. So just kind of living dormant in your body and waiting for their opportunity to come out. So mold is their opportunity. Somebody else's opportunity could also be trauma, you know, or some other life altering events and things like that. But mold seems to be so impactful on what it does to the immune system that, again, it's my sole focus, but this was because it happened to me too. And I was aware of mold for the last 20 years, but now that we have testing, that's much easier, we can actually see. And again, I'm a big believer of the assess just to see it's also helpful for family members and other people to kind of realize that yes this is something in that person's body right yeah because a lot of people um deny that same with Lyme disease they don't really even believe that exists there's still a lot of people that believe that and um so you're saying there's still a lot of people that don't believe that Lyme disease exists yeah okay or they, and they diminish, like if someone comes with all the classic symptoms or like, well, we'll run the CDC test, uh, you know, that's approved, but I doubt you have that, even though it is very common, very prevalent. But again, I feel like mold is almost in that category where Lyme has been for many years, where you're asking doctors for these tests, the testing it was not very good. And I mean, for mold, unless you see a functional practitioner there they don't run the correct test because they don't really have them right at your general doctor right hey listen there's also people that believe the earth is flat that the holocaust never happened right you know it's it, yeah. it's it's a crazy world out there where people that just don't observe or believe in real scientific information 
Um, and, you know, unfortunately, some of these people that don't believe things are highly accredited people. I mean, we're talking, uh, I've, I've seen a lot of industrial hygienists, which are highly scholared, you know, um, folks who really have studied buildings for, for as a career that refuse to believe microbiological contamination is as prevalent as it is. And it, it blows my mind, but yeah. they, these things exist. Right. And so we have to start asking ourselves, you know, what, how are we going to discern information between fact and fiction? Right. And I think that's really the, 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 the big piece of this puzzle. What, what I think both of us can confidently say is based upon the existing studies, Sure, there might be some confirmation bias in there. You know, one can argue that either way. Um, in some cases, the data needs to be fleshed out better. We have hundreds of papers out there that all point to environmental toxins and almost any anything under the sun, from inhalational Alzheimer's, early onset of dementia, right? And that, that's cancer, part of right? Yeah. Um, we need these naysayers, if you will, it's not helpful to just say, no, this is impossible. What would be helpful is if you said, this is an interesting theory. I would love to see more studies being developed around this so we can really understand the brevity of the impact, right? Instead of saying, no, um, you know, this test that's being used is not the gold standard. And it's like, well, how do you introduce new technology? Right. Right. The air test, for example, in people's homes, that is the gold standard once was not the gold standard. And if you look up, yeah. if you look back up on the development of that test, it was like, this is nonsense and blah, 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 blah. This is how we introduce new ideas and new technology and how we use that new technology to uncover new information. Same thing with ERMI happened, right? ERMI, the Environmental Relative Moldiness Index, it was like EPA did this whole study. They created this index off of PCR technology. And then it was, you know, then people started using it to, to discern information. And what ends up happening is the, the EPA says, oh, this is just a research tool, guys. Well, what people misunderstood about that statement was that the ERMI, which is a score, is a research tool. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. If you ever tried to understand the score, it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't. But the data, how it's much mold is actually there, that's PCR technology, baby. That is valid. Tell me it's not valid, then, then you're, you're in the camp of COVID's a hoax here because... The reality of the situation is PCR technology is DNA specific evidence. It tells us that it tells us what is there. Microscopy, which is what the air testing technology is based on. It collects air, collects these particles, puts them in a slide and then they look under a microscope. That is a human being physically counting. Hey, I'm a great counter, but sometimes I have to recount. Okay. Now, the other part of this human error aspect is they can't tell certain mold species apart. Where in DNA, it's DNA. You can. You can know exactly. That's Aspergillus versicolor. That's Aspergillus penicillulates, right? You could, you could tell because it's DNA specific. But when you're counting, you can't. And if you don't believe me, go look at any air test. You'll see a column. It'll say Aspergillus slash penicillium dash like like because similar they all look pretty similar to me so i'm just going to count those and put them all together right and so you're not able to extrapolate the information properly because it's all jumbled into one and there are several species of aspergillus and several species of penicillium that might be worth understanding exactly what you have and so i you know i share all this with you in passion because i think at the end of the day we're at we're at a foundation level of a new frontier inside yeah. holistic health. And you and I both believe that this plays a massive role 
in our healthcare system and in human health as a pop global population. And I and I'm speaking for you because you told me that 90% of your 98% of your practice has shifted towards the how how important figuring out if mold's part of the equation for the for each client is or not, right? Yeah, it's the other thing I would say with that too is that it basically, you know, we still need to address every, you know, every client, you still have to address what's going on with their gut and, you know, other potential viruses, bacteria, whatnot, you know, if parasites, heavy metals, environmental toxins. I got into this because I loved, well, I, I guess I'd say I was very passionate about environmental toxins first, right? With sick building syndrome, like 20 years ago, but it was more of these things that were making people sick and chemicals and whatnot. But so my whole, again, my shift has changed because, and the whole practice has changed because mold is at the top of being the most impactful from what I see over and over and over again with all the labs. And it just, when we look at root causes and mold is in that piece for somebody, it's really, really critical to address in the body and in the home. So um, yeah, it's, it's sort of taken over my world in that regard. And again, I've been in this world for over 20 years. I love studying all the different toxins. It's just, I see this time and time again as the most impactful. And so I always want to talk to people about it because if that's something that we can address and look at and find and the tests are easier now, then it should be to me something that we, we look into, especially for the adults, but these little kids, kids are getting sick really, really young. And if we can prevent some of these things that just are caused by mold exposure when they were a child, I mean, that's amazing and really, really beneficial. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Last question I have before you go. All right. So when you're dealing with environmental toxins, again, whether it causes or exacerbates, I don't think that part matters, at least at this time. What do you address first? Like, let's say I come to you and I have Lyme disease and Hashimoto's and I have mold. What am I addressing first? So first we look at foundation things, kind of like that, of um, making sure you know, again, it's a little bit more of your lifestyle, but the, the air is clean, the water's clean, the food is clean, um, you're getting good sleep, you move your mindset. But on a toxin level, we have to make sure, you know, that the person eliminates well, so they go to the bathroom, um, you know, because if, if things are blocked up, then that does not work. Any sort of detox will be really bad. But mold is always what I begin with. Again, at the same time, we're still working on the gut and things like that. And then Lyme is usually later on. But if you know you just layer little pieces like a smaller treatments for Lyme if someone's very symptomatic, like if they have a ton of joint pain or um, brain inflammation, we still need to work on that a little bit. But mold is constant throughout. And because it actually takes so long to work on, it's throughout the whole treatment protocol until I see that it's gone. And so for a lot of people that is usually like 18 months to long or longer, but I usually see people with, it's rare they have one type of mold. How often I see people with four to six types. Yeah. And so mold takes the longest. You start addressing that immediately throughout. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to address other things successfully without addressing mold? Oh, I don't think so. So I think that basically the mold you have to work on the whole time because it's often one of the biggest, most impactful root causes. If you're just working, let's say you work on the thyroid for Hashimoto's, you know, we can do other things. Like sometimes you can get people's numbers and inflammation down by changing their diet and removing gluten and sugar and things. But if the mold piece is there, which with Hashimoto's, I see it 100% of the time, we are not going to be able to really get your mold, uh, your thyroid markers back into normal range without addressing mold. And same with Lyme, in my opinion. 
The Lyme is extra complicated. The same, I don't throw antivirals at somebody who has high obscene bar count um, and reactivation. We're working on mold the whole time and then you're supporting with some, with other things that are, again, antivirals, but my main focus is the mold. When you said the word antiviral, it just made me realize, you know, how anytime I was sick, I would go to the doctor, they'd be like, take an antibiotic. And I'm like, pretty sure this, this is a virus, not bacteria. Yeah. Just take an antibiotic anyway. It's not going to work, but take it. Well, and that's the thing. So in Chinese medicine, which how I was trained as well is, you know, a lot of there's antiviral herbs, antibacterial, antifungals. And a lot of them overlap in function. So that's my job, right, as the practitioner, is to try to get you on the best protocol that overlaps with a lot of the symptoms that you have in addition to what we see in the labs, because it's not, otherwise you're getting like a pill for every ill. And all of my clients have multiple, multiple layers. And so you then again, you end up with, you know, the supplement pharmacy, like, every single person that's been to a naturopath or an integrative doctor gives you. Makes sense. That makes sense. Pill for every ill. The, the one thing about the pill for every ill is we do need plans to get off these pills one day, right? Yeah. Yeah. Ashley, it was such a pleasure having you on a second time. Uh, thank you so much for being here and donating your time. Um, hopefully, this was an amazing conversation for you all. I know I had a lot of fun. Um, sorry if I offended everybody. I know I, I get passionate, um, you know, sometimes and go off the rails a bit. Um, but, you know, I think it's important that um, we create this environment where we ask questions because that's how we're going to get somewhere. I got here where I am today by asking a lot of questions, observing a lot of patterns, um, which frankly, didn't exist, right? The mold toxicity today, it is a very niche under the radar thing. Many doctors don't know about only specialists like you do, right? And it's important we start opening our minds and looking at data. I mean, if there's one thing anyone understands, it's how important data is. If you're in marketing, data and how successful your marketing is working, makes drives your decisions. If you're in business, data and KPIs, all these things we utilize to further our business. Data is used in health to understand what's abnormal about the human body so we can try to figure out what's going on and fix it. Data of the home helps us drive decisions. How we fix the home and create healthier environments. Data is king. I think that... Um, we have to understand that a lot of advice we get out there is given to us without fundamental data. There's a lack of data that certain people provide evidence, advice to, based upon, which is crazy. As you mentioned earlier, there's doctors out there that might not know about mold or environmental toxins, but yet they're telling people things like that can't cause that. And we need to start saying, I haven't heard about that yet. There might be other specialists that might understand this a little better that you might want to seek out. You know, yeah. just because yeah. you don't know something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Yeah. And I, I do get that a little more now where someone said, Hey, my doctor ran this mycotoxin test. And I go, and sometimes I go, Oh, well, you know, the one I use checks for twice as many. <laughs> so we can still use this, but at the same time, you know, ideally they come to you in the beginning of their journey so that you give them the, again, the right tests for the home, the right direction so that they're not wasting money and time. Right. But it is even, you know, it's good yeah. that the person is open to that because that's not always the case either. Yeah. And look, right now there are, are very unique individuals like myself and yourself that people can get help from. Yes. But truthfully, we need this to become the norm, not the exception, right? right? And only then will we be able to really be a healthy civilization. I want to thank you for taking the time to be here with me again today. And uh, this was a great conversation. And please come back again soon.
course. I always love chatting about this topic.